Hello, welcome. I'm Professor Bridget Byrne, Director of Code, the Centre on the Dynamics of Ethnicity, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to the first session in this conference organised with the Stuart, sorry, to the third session in this conference organised with the Stuart Hall Foundation, Racial Inequality in Times of Crisis. While COVID-19 highlighted and exacerbated long-standing racial and ethnic inequalities in the UK across a range of social arenas, the ensuing crises in living standards and the criminalisation of protests could further entrench these inequalities. As the pandemic wanes, we are thrust into a confluence of crises. Government, governmental inertia in response to the cost of living crisis and climate change and a coordinated attack on the civil right to protest. While COVID-19 threw existing inequalities into sharp relief, these crises continue to disproportionately impact the lives of society's most vulnerable people. Racial inequality in times of crisis is a week-long week online conference exploring the impact of present day crises on racially minoritized peoples and communities in the UK. The event is hosted through a partnership between the Stuart Hall Foundation and the Centre on the Dynamics of Ethnicity. We've invited researchers, journalists and practitioners working across fields of sociology, art, history, media, activism, politics and healthcare to take part in a series of online presentations and discussions that focus on a number of areas impacted by COVID-19 and ensuing crisis. And we've already discussed policing and education and policing, activism and LGBTQ plus rights, recordings of which will soon be on our websites. And today we're looking at housing and tomorrow health. Just to tell you a little bit about CODE, the Centre on the Dynamics of Ethnicity, it's a research centre based at the University of Manchester, but bringing together colleagues from six universities across the UK. Our current research programme is looking at COVID race and ethnic inequalities and seeks to provide a rapid response to the crisis posed by COVID-19 and its social, cultural and economic impact on racially minoritized groups. We're a multidisciplinary team using a range of different methods and seeking to provide robust evidence on the often lethal impact of race and ethnic dis discrimination and inequality. We aim to provide new data in accessible formats to champion policy and institutional change by showing where and how racial inequality is present, how it builds on and, exists and extends existing patterns of inequality, and how this is experienced in everyday lives. We're very clear that the impact of racial and ethnic discrimination and disadvantage are not one-off events, but processes that happen across the life course and across all aspects of the lives of individuals and communities. We want to understand how these processes we want to understand these processes, but also working with a range of partners, we want to think about how communities are challenging discrimination and disadvantage, particularly in the wake of Black Lives Matter. Just to say a little bit about the Stuart, Stuart Hall Foundation, it was established in 2015 by Professor Stuart Hall's family, friends and colleagues. The foundation is committed to public ed education, addressing urgent questions of race and inequality in culture and society, through talks and events and building a growing network of uh, Stuart Hall Foundation scholars and artists and residents. The foundation works collaboratively to forge creative partnerships in the spirit of Stuart Hall, thinking together and working towards a racially just and more equal future. We're really pleased at CODE to have this partnership with the Stuart Hall Foundation. We take on Stuart Hall's call for the aim of academic research on race and racism to be to change the world by challenging racial injustice and discrimination. So I'm very pleased that today's panel is going to discuss the quest question of that basic human right, the right to have safe, secure and suitable shelter. And I'm very pleased to hand over now to Ruby Lot Lavinia, who will chair the event. Hi Bridget, thanks so much for doing that. And uh, hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and obviously welcome to the Stuart Hall Foundation's Racial Inequality in Times of Crisis and Day 3 on Housing. Uh, just to introduce myself briefly, um, my name is Ruby, I'm a journalist at Open Democracy, I do news and politics journalism, and I focus on stories around housing and inequalities. So I cover things from illegal evictions to the social housing sector to gentrification and all number of other things. Um, we've got a really cool 
group of people on the panel today. I hope they uh, enjoy me calling them cool. Um, so today we'll have uh, joining us uh, Nigel de Nerona, a research associate at Manchester University, looking at housing, race and migration, particularly in the UK. Thank you for popping up and waving. <laughs> uh, then we will also have uh, Samir Jaraj, an author and journalist at The New Statesman. Um, Samir, if you could appear and show yourself, that'd be great. Um, who writes on many things, but is particularly great on tenants' rights and housing policy. Um, and then we also have uh, Stuart Hawkinson, Associate Professor of Critical Urban Geography at the University of Leeds, specialising in housing privatisation, urban regeneration and gentrification in the UK. Um, thanks, guys. This is what they look like. Um, you can now disappear. Uh, so the panel today is going to focus on loads of areas. Um, such as financialization of the housing, housing and how that's affected, created uh, the housing crisis, the impact of austerity, welfare reform, uh, impact of hostile environment on housing, uh, the cost of regeneration, regeneration, uh, and legacies of Thatcherism uh, on the current housing crisis. Um, the structure is as follows. We'll have uh, three short presentations from our panelists. Um, and once that's over, we'll open to uh, me asking them some general questions. Um, and then once that's done, we'll move to a Q&A uh, with the audience. Um, you can drop your questions in the useful Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can do that throughout uh, the chat. So um, feel free to drop it in when it comes into your brain. You don't have to wait until we get to the um, Q&A section. Um, and obviously questions, not comments, because that's not useful. Um, and yeah, we really look forward to your contributions and the discussion. So I guess without any further ado, let's kick off with our first panelist, uh, Nigel. Okay, so thanks very much. Um, what I'm going to talk about is based on some work that we have just started with Greater Manchester Tenants Union. Um, and um, in particular, the anti-racist group within the Greater Manchester Tenants Union. Um, so we're writing a piece and um, we felt that to look at that, we needed to understand some of the history um, of place. So um, the focus is on housing and race in Manchester. I'm painting it as a city of contradiction. So if you visit, you may well be encouraged to think of the radical Manchester of Marx and Engels of suffragettes, et cetera. Um, but the other side of Manchester is it's a mercantile city. It's a city of merchants and that's where its wealth has come from. So I'm gonna take you through um, some time periods linked to that. So first of all, uh, we're focusing particularly on Mossai. So I've shown that on the map of Manchester, um, two areas, Moss Side East and Moss Side West. And those are the kind of site of both the Tenants Union organizing that we're exploring and also the historical legacy. But the start of this process was um, the Industrial Revolution, migration from rural England, Ireland and Europe. But by the late 19th century, production of textiles had been to some extent supplanted by trading and a growing merchant class um, and the city was too small for the kind of middle classes needed to do that and one of the first areas for development was Mossai. Um, so it went from four, 450 houses in 1861. Um, the second picture down is a picture of Pepperhill Farm, which was on the, on the site of the current um, council estate, up to five and a half thousand in 1901. And the picture at the bottom shows Moss Side at that point. As well as being a resident, residential setting for middle-class um, people working in, in the industries and trades in Manchester, it was also a place where people would come and stay to trade. So North African and European traders, there were embassies and commissions um, from different countries and some seamen and students. Um, but um, a lovely term, I think, but what that began to change um, with the introduction of house farming. And house farming was the process of landlords buying large houses 
and subdividing them to rent one or two rooms to families. Um, the quote from the Manchester Guardian here uh, is basically emphasizing that, that houses near Greenhays were described as being occupied by several families. Uh, there was a whole issue about public assistance at the time and how much the council was paying for that. Um, and sanitary conditions and so on were pretty bad. I mean, they kind of, um, it, it's hard to describe them, but they were in, unfit for human habitation. So the housing conditions in Moss Side were there when post-war war migration came to the new um, from the new Commonwealth happened. Um, and initial places that people stayed who came from the Caribbean and Africa were lodging houses in Moss Side. Um, a bit later, some were bought by Africans. And for people choosing to live here, there was a kind of preference. So in other parts of the city, um, there were more prevalent racism. In uh, other cities, people found it more difficult either to find accommodation or to find employment. So there's evidence of quite a lot of internal migration into Maasai from Liverpool and Birmingham, for example. So that period is kind of associated with the transformation, um, the, the issue of race um, and the kind of challenges to that, particularly from the political classes who saw this as uh, the first signs of swamping and that kind of rhetoric that came through from Thatcher. Um, what happened then was that the, those areas were targeted for clearance. And in particular, the um, two parts of Moss Side were targeted for separate clearance. So in Hume, which is slightly closer to the center, there was building of crescents, towers, and maisonettes. In half of Moss Side, the um, ho terraced housing was replaced with a low rise housing estate. And in order to accommodate that, many families were shipped out to overspill estates um, outside of the city boundaries. And this led to issues with a number of young black people coming back and sofa surfing and sleeping rough to the extent that there was a homelessness hostel set up within Moss Side to accommodate young people coming in for um, whatever reason. Um, in the other half of the uh, of Moss Side, improvement was finally agreed. There was a period of about five years of wrangling um, and quite a lot of that was acquired by housing associations who've been set up. Now, this is where we have open questions, but the research so far suggests that Black self-organization in terms of the Black Unity and Freedom Party was part of the resistance to the first clearance in Moss Side, and that the campaign for the second part of Moss Side um, appears to have been a very white one. So it, we want to find out what that group were doing about that campaign as well. So what happened after that is a kind of series of um, stigmas attached to the place. Uh, there were high levels of youth employment, um, riots or rebellion is the term I prefer to use, um, policing of the area completely disproportionately. Um, I can remember standing outside the police station in 1981 after the riots, and it looked very much like we were in a civil war zone, very much like somewhere like Belfast with um, the police station protected by barbed wire, uh, filming of, of the demonstrators taking place, et cetera. Um, meanwhile, in Hume, where families were, um, it was decided it was unsafe for families, there was a kind of growing counterculture. Um, and Moss Side continued to change. It still remained as a kind of reception area, I suppose, because of the cheap housing. So there were ongoing waves of migration of Somalians and refugees. Um, so we move into the more um, contemporary times. So Hume then became a site for a particular model of regeneration. Um, so the Crescents were cleared, the aim to create a mixed tenure environment. So the effect of that was to reduce the proportion of social housing from 85% to 40%, but to replace that lost social housing with 45% private rented sector housing. And in Moss Side, a number of infill developments began to provide gated communities within the areas. So 
looking at where we are now, um, this transformation is continuing. So in the Manchester context, very high levels of financialization. The Abu Dhabi group who own Manchester City and other major investors buying up most of the housing stock that is being developed. Significant growth of Airbnb and demand by from the retention of students in the economy that leads to changes in housing provision. So the transformation of the inner city to new middle class forms of housing. Um, a second kind of wave of change coming from university development and growing numbers of students leading to um, then student taking over houses in parts of Moss Side and Hume. Um, and I think one of the particular concerns we have from the tenants union is that the housing association appears to have lost its, min its mission to serve the area. Um, there's a lack of investment and the work that's being done is trying to build by street mobilization an inclusive union in Moss Side and Hume that addresses the conditions in both social and private sector housing. So thanks very much. That's kind of my presentation done. So, and I'll... Great, thank you so much, Nigel. That was um, really good and very on time. My alarm hasn't even gone off. Um, so other panelists be warned because I will come and lurk on the screen if you start to go over your time and then I will tell you to be quiet. Um, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, now we're going to move on to Samir. If you want to appear, Samir, um, and join us, that would be great. Um, I just need Nigel to stop sharing and then I can share. There we go. So, I mean, so I'll quickly introduce myself. I'm Samir, as, uh, as you heard, I'm a journalist at the New Statesman. Um, and I, I first started writing about housing probably, I think about 2011, so over a decade ago, in part because it was a, it was a topic that was quite poorly covered in the media at the time. Most of the coverage of housing was predominantly um, uh, like property journalism, um, so about the property market. There might be the occasional bit of uh, of, of journalism about um, about social housing, um, but very little uh, in particular about kind of social issues in private private renting, which is what I focused on for a long time. Um, so I mean, this is a kind of a, yeah, my kind of like reflections on on that on that time so da, da. so you know throughout this this period has, has been a period of, of austerity you know it looks like it's very likely that we're moving back into one um but i think it's helpful to remember like what what happened so you know as we as you may remember um the period of austerity started um, as a result of the, the credit crunch, a speculative housing boom um, in the US led to a global recession. Governments intervened uh, to bail out the banks um, and then largely failed to restructure, uh, restructure them or actually kind of like implement any significantly radical policy as a result. Um, in the UK, interestingly, so at the time I was a local councillor, um, and even before the election of the coalition government in 2010, council budgets took a took a huge hit um, because they were quite heavily invested in um, in kind of various sort of you know, uh, stocks, shares, um, and Icelandic banks were. Uh, was the kind of common one which a lot of councils had invested in because they were like AAA rated um, and when they collapsed councils were left out of pocket. Um, the government at the time, uh, Brown, the Brown government, actually tried to bring forward its uh, infrastructure and capital projects. A lot of that, you know, kind of looked at, at housing. So, for example, they started the process, but actually kind of didn't quite finish it of um, 
um, the, ironically, the, uh, the coalition government finished this, of uh, um, enabling local governments to build uh, council housing again in exchange for taking on a whole chunk of debt and kind of tearing apart the the um, subsidy system that had that had existed um, in what was called the, the housing revenue account, so like um, social housing finance with the councils. New government pretty much had a very, if any, commitment, uh, a very weak, if any, commitment to racial equality or or any other, um, for that matter. Uh, but so, I mean, communities of, of colour, even in 2010, you know, were not necessarily in a, a you know, a, a particularly good position. They, you know, there have been decades of, of structural inequality, of structural racism. Um, New Labour were not particularly interested in in pursuing again like radical policies of of uh of um you know, redistribution and racial justice um so you know these housing inequalities persisted um and you know so so, so i remember i was once on a on a panel a few years back and someone said well the housing crisis existed um uh, long before it's only because like the housing crisis isn't affecting basically kind of like white middle class people that uh that actually the kind of like the the public took attention there was for example a significant issue with um uh people in bed and breakfast um kind of homelessness accommodation in the early 2000s um rates of home ownership declined from about the mid 2000s um and you would find that those that those trends would would, would have been reflected kind of much earlier, much more significantly in communities of colour. Um, so as I said, there's, there's representation of, in um, social housing, representation in own occupation. Younger people had limited um, options in terms of uh, in terms of housing. Um, new Labour's urban renewal projects, as you all as you know, you've heard from Nigel and you will hear from from Stuart, um, were in, they were causing direct and indirect displacement, which disproportionately affected communities of colour because they were overrepresented in social housing, and that these areas became um, kind of targets of of regeneration, renewal, whatever you would call it. Um, but also, I, th I think it's it's important to note the kind of how the cultural presentation of social housing um, was throughout that time is very much. This kind of like decline narrative that you know that again that the um incoming um conservative prime minister david cameron you know kind of talked about this kind of broken britain narrative and, and something which which tony blair had had also kind of uh, um played on as well throughout his throughout his uh, tenure the coalition government's austerity program if you get to the kind of the, the meat of it all so they introduced emergency budget in early um, on in in 2010. I think that was maybe October. Um, you know, the, um, with significant welfare cuts, um, then a comprehensive spending review, and then further um, cuts to to uh, welfare in the 2012 budget as well, as well as the um, uh, welfare reform act of the time, which introduced things like universal credit um, and scrapped um uh like other benefits like income support uh the social housing budget was was cut it it wasn't massive to begin with um by about 80 percent during that time um this had the effect of amongst other things of housing associations being pushed towards commercialization um towards uh, setting rents more towards market rates and building building um, market housing for sale um, to subsidise shared ownership and uh, what what they would call like general needs like social rented housing. Um, I've noticed a type of the next one. There was a large rise of, in people who had a social need or a housing need going into private rented housing, not to social housing. Um, so there's a significant like shortage of social housing and a significant rise in people needing it so hence they ended up in a private renting which is under regulated poor condition and insecure 
um, all of these factors, um, as we'll see in the next slide, disproportionately affected use the color. Um, and there was a, you know, um, in less than a, a year after there were riots, um, and again, there was very much the kind of like narrative that you know, it's all, all the kind of like young black people who live in social housing were were responsible for the for, for the riots. The law was amended to exclude people who committed a variety of events from social housing, um, and you know, again, there's this this um, like the use of uh, of criminalization um which has um actually kind of turned up a bit um a bit more in um in anti-gangs anti policy more recently where uh, um where access to housing is um is restricted uh, but that's not that's 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 more kind of like local policy level so the welfare reforms disproportionately affected communities of color the the benefit cap um was especially hard because um uh because communities of colour tended to live within um, cities which tended to have higher rents. The two-child rate for universal credit um, also has an um, effect because um, communities of colour tend to have larger families. Um, then you had the kind of like the introduction of more xenophobic right to rent policies under the hostile environment, um, the key one of which was uh, right to rent. Um, and it, you know, which enabled direct discrimination. There's already evidence up to then um, of uh, discrimination within private rented housing, like in particular against um, uh, Black Caribbean people. The BBC did an investigation into that in, uh, I think, 2013. Um, and the right to rent essentially makes the possession of various passport a kind of the, the standard kind of ID um, in the sector. Um, so this is, you know, like there's a, a rise in 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 discrimination, um, and there's a rising proportion of uh, homeless people of color um, linked to migration status and and displacement as a result of all of these factors together. And um, so, so, sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah. it's been ten minutes. So if you could okay. quickly summarize yours. Yeah. Great. So the current picture. Um, you know, racial inequalities in housing plays significant impact in terms of COVID, um, in terms of um, like the the proportion like overcrowding issues, and uh, like a large proportion of multi generational households. Local councils and housing associations are severely limited in their ability to respond. Um, not that they can't, and they uh, and regeneration is the is the key example of where. Um, progressive and radical um, policy could be implemented and could push back. But, you know, the, the results from some research from the Joseph Browntree Foundation found, you know, like um, confirmed that um, communities of colour have faced significant housing issues around high costs, affordability, um, and in terms of uh, eviction as well. So we've seen this, you know, like austerity period that as austerity has pressed down on communities throughout the UK, it has pressed down much harder um, because of the existing structural and uh, racial inequalities in the UK. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, that was fascinating. I'm sorry to have pushed you to end quicker there, um, especially uh, the um, riot offences was uh, included as an exclusion for social housing. That's very, after the London riots, that's mad um, and super fascinating. So thank you, um, Samir. Um, now uh, I'd love to introduce Stuart to join us and share his presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, hope you can hear me okay. So yeah, uh, my name is Stuart Hodkinson. I work at the University of Leeds. And um, I'm really delighted to be invited to this um, conference. I'm going to talk about well, the same kind of issues, but I'm going to focus through, I suppose, ex particular experiences of housing conditions and regeneration, thinking about housing and regeneration both taking place in a hostile environment, but also representing or being drivers of the hostile environment as, as well, but, in, but in, in lots of different ways. And I'm just trying to move my slides. Oh yeah, there we go, great. 
so I'll, I want to start with the Grenfell disaster for, for some fairly obvious reasons. Um, there's been a critique uh, and a very, a very, um, a very, well, a very persuasive critique that Grenfell was primarily seen through the lens of neoliberalism and, um, you know, as a kind of like a, a, a disaster of neoliberal deregulation and privatization and outsourcing uh, and also austerity. And the, the racial dimension of, of Grenfell was downplayed, um, particularly uh, among academics who have um, tried to explain um, the kind of bigger picture in which Grenfell took place. And it's a, it's a, like, it's a critique that I, I've, I've reflected upon and I find it very important. It's made me rethink quite a lot about what the research that I've been doing. Um, so since Grenfell, I've been looking at fire safety issues and going back and looking again at some of the data that may or may not exist. And what was really interesting about Grenfell, really terrible about Grenfell, um, was that even though um, black, Asian and minority ethnic people comprise approximately 15% of the UK population, around 85% of, of the people that died, the 71 victims on the night uh, of the Grenfell disaster in 2017, were um, from communities of colour or from black um, um, minority ethnic communities, um, which is an unbelievably disproportionate um, discrimination in, in, in so many ways to think about that. Uh, and again, it was kind of declared as well, maybe it's a one-off, maybe these kinds of, it's just like a one-off event just so happened that um, that was, those were the people living in that town block. But if you go back to the Lackanar House fire of 2009, which was the previous, um, the previous um, fire which had the most deaths um, in a residential fire here in the UK for, 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 for a long time, um, something like five, of the six people that died were also from um, Bain communities. So then we start to think, well, you know, how 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 can we get such high proportions of of communities of colour being effect, being well dying in fires in, in tower blocks? So part of that explanation is that there is a real large concentration in social housing, particularly in high-rise social housing blocks, of um, Bain residents, and I can't see the bottom of my screen for some reason, which is really frustrating. Um, so I can't quite see the final point on my slide. Um, but what it shows us is that there is a structural racial dimension to um, how, the, how fires take place in tower blocks, the conditions of tower blocks and the conditions of people living in social housing. That maybe previously we, we particularly people like myself as academics were we're not paying attention to. And you've, we've often heard the phrase that fires don't discriminate, but actually they do, or they appear to discriminate in quite significant ways. So again, if we, if we, if we do not accept the idea that Grenfell and Lacanal and other kinds of fires are one-offs, um, that actually there may be some kind of systemic, structural, racial aspect going on here. So I've been trying to find some data. There isn't very much of it. Which it's interesting in its own right that data is not being collected about, um, about victims of fires, about um, the, the identity, often the age, the disabilities of people who experience fires. But there's some data has started to be collected. I found some data for London. Since 2009, data has been collected on uh, fatalities in fire. And we keep getting told this message time and time again that, you know, um, fires are falling, number of fires are falling, number of fatalities of fires are falling, um, which is this kind of reassuring message. But actually, when we get underneath that, that, that declining um, risk profile of housing, we see quite stark racial inequalities in both who experience fire and also who die in fires. So again, thinking that around 15% of the population are from um, Bain backgrounds, Bain communities, and then looking at the proportion of victims of fires, people who died in fires, when we're getting up to um, 20, 44, 31, 44, and in the year of Grenfell Tower, 68% of victims being from uh, Black and Asian minority ethnic backgrounds. This is, this is a pattern. 
the numbers are very small, so we can't necessarily get this kind of clear cause and correlation. But if we do look to the United States, um, where there's been some recent high profile, profile fires, where there's much better data being collected, and there are significantly more fires and more victims of fires, we see the same very similar patterns um, that uh, black people in the United States are twice as likely to, to die in fires um, than, than anyone else. And there's an interesting campaign now emerging in, in the United States um, of, to try to raise awareness of this and try to actually think about why this is happening. So I start with fire and I started with the Grenfell Tower um, disaster and, and try to yeah, bring race back into that from, as someone who previously hasn't thought about it in those terms. And rather than think of this as something to do with with, um, with social housing or the tower blocks. It's obviously something that's endemic to like the wider housing system. Structural racism is clearly prevalent in, in every single way that you measure it. There's recently been, in 2016, Kevin Gulliver wrote uh, a report that assessed uh, issues of race and housing over a long uh, period of perspective and found you know, that the housing, to quote, the housing circumstances of BME groups continue to be less favorable than for whites and covered things to do with obviously home ownership, um, asset wealth, having much lower levels of asset accumulation, much more likely to live in older fuel poor overcrowded housing, um, overcrowded housing also being um, more likely to be damp uh, and generally unfit housing. Also more likely to be disproportionately homeless um, and, and, and need of housing per se. So there's something you know really fundamental here that we should definitely continue to, to talk about and, and I'm sure we will in the conversation. I wanna just quickly focus on an example of regeneration that I think, and I've gone back and thought about this case study is a case study from my research. Um, I spent seven, seven years pretty much working with uh, residents on the Mansfield North Estate and I never really, even though it was obvious that this was a, a predominantly African Caribbean community, um, I never really, um, well, I didn't think of things in terms of the racialization of regeneration. I thought of things very much in terms of class and the big structures of, of capital investment moving in and displacement of, of working class communities. But actually it, it is a textbook example of what, of what many authors have talked about in terms of slow violence and the combinations of structural institutional racism in gentrification and housing provision more broadly. Mansfield North is um, located in North Brixton for, for people who, who are from the area. Um, it was a council estate that was built in the mid seventies as part of that whole slum clearance process that Nigel was talking about before. And yeah, it was a predominantly African Caribbean community and it was predominantly social housing. It was, uh, when I visited there for the first time, about 70% of the, of the housing there was, was council housing. It was suffering from that legacy of the rollback neoliberalism on council states, you know, decades of disinvestment and kind of permanent austerity, which had led to council states kind of becoming dilapidated and, and, and physically run down. And it's another one of these examples of um, governments and local authorities and private developers coming together and selling this incredible vision uh, that everything was gonna be um, regenerated and improved for, 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 the, for the existing community. And there was this existing promise that private development would be very modest, identification would be minimal, but the community, the existing community would be retained. And once that regeneration scene started in 2012, all of those promises uh, evaporate. It's a, it's a regeneration scheme that's marked by, you know, majority of the estate being demolished, um, incredible densification, like the doubling of, of densities, so the doubling number of housing units on, on the estate, and, you know, quite radical tenure change. So from social housing uh, being the vast majority of housing, now we have private housing, private housing to, to buy leasehold flats. A majority uh, of uh, Black community becoming pretty much a majority white community there or thereabouts. And just to explain, um, in the background, you have austerity kicking in, uh, you have withdrawal of public funding. So you have built into this regeneration process, much more pressure to develop 
value from the estate, from the land, um, which obviously means more private development, more house sales. Um, Stuart, I'm, I'm just interrupting you briefly to tell you you've hit 10 minutes. So if you could Fantastic. just okay. uh, so, speed up and summarise that. I'm going for it, yeah. So many things happen as this regeneration scheme, and I can talk about it in, in later conversation. First thing we see is this kind of the erasing of the estate and the fact that it is Brixton. Um, the, the whole marketing of this regeneration scheme is to kind of erase black people from it for uh, potential investors and also at the same time to people who might buy homes more locally to also sell the cultural attractions of Brixton but sort of pretend that Mansfield doesn't really belong there. We see the most unbelievable appalling work uh, the kind of the kind of vandalism that you just could not imagine totally across the estate in terms of the conditions and people having to live through this appalling work, which I can again explain under discussion. Um, when residents challenge this, um, you know, everything you could possibly imagine not working on this brand new, all these brand new homes and, and refurbished homes, they're told, look mate, this ain't Chelsea, which isn't just about a, a class statement, it's also a race statement saying, you lot, you black working class people on the estate, you're not getting Chelsea style, treatment. Um, only a few days ago, residents found all the communal areas in blocks on the estate being reopened because they found that the, the walls are not even basic in terms of building regulations for fire protection. And a particular story which I want to come back to is how black homeowners themselves experience a, a deeply traumatizing process of being uprooted, of being dis dispossessed and being displaced. Um, which actually leads to people dying from the stress and the anxiety. And I can explain more about that. But I also want to point out to, to, to finish, to conclude that the residents in this process, just as at Grenfell and at Lackanel House, which were also regeneration schemes of, of kinds, uh, they were not passive victims, they were constantly organizing, constantly resisting. And actually the outcomes, which were terrible, could have been so much worse if they had not resisted. So there is agency of, of, of struggle going on all the time right now which we often don't hear about in the news thank you great thank you so much Stuart um I thought that was really effective in kind of showing the the real world um impacts and effects of the housing crisis um you know I think we should always keep Grenfell in our minds it's such a shocking thing to have happened and are really the kind of post grandpa world we live in, unfortunately, in many ways has, um, I think, not delivered a lot of the things that we wanted to. Um, and maybe that's something we can talk about in the discussion. But if I could just welcome all the panelists to kind of turn their cameras back on um, and their mics. Um, and I have a few questions um, that I will kind of direct around. Um, and, you know, obviously feel free to jump in and discuss in whatever way, if there was stuff that, you know, you didn't get to cover in your presentation. Um, feel free to to just like whack it in in a conversation um, and everyone who's watching if you have questions as ever just drop them in the Q&A now and once we get to the end of, of kind of this section um, we'll we'll dip into those um, no need to wait till the end to do that um, so I guess first off um, I, I thought I'd just kind of go back to the root here um, there are obviously many factors that have affected today's housing crisis. I'm going to ask each one of you, in your opinion, what do you think has had the most damaging impact on housing in the UK, um, particularly thinking in terms of like a racial aspect? Um, so should we, uh, Nigel, seeing as you haven't spoken uh, for ages, do you want to kick off first? Um, I suppose my, my perspective and, and thinking about my side is that the racial aspect has always been there in exclusion. Mm -hmm. So we can go back to the rationale for the 1962 um, Immigration Act, which was very much pressure from local authorities like Manchester, like Birmingham, about the impact of migrants on houses when they were trying to get into slum clearance. And we can actually go back to 1902 and the um, rationale for the Aliens Act, which was justified by MPs talking about being swamped by people from Eastern Europe. I mean, I think this is a, a kind of traditional way of explaining why resources are not available to 
other people. Today, we've got the census headlines with how many people were born outside the UK. And that kind of rhetoric underpins the exclusion. So I think that's the rationale why um, housing is racialized. I think the other side of the story is why isn't housing adequate? It's because we move from housing as a right to housing as an asset. And essentially housing is an investment bubble. Manchester is a, is a classic example, but all over the country, we see housing as investment for people from who've got too much money um, and therefore no easy way in for those newer people into the housing market. So we have a kind of, you know, age-based, race-based discrimination that um, is excluding significant groups from the housing market. Okay, great. Um, and Samir, how about you? Um, so I would, I would probably still kind of go with the, with the, with the right to buy. So in, you know, 1979, Maybe like one in three um, like homes in the UK is a council home. Today, that's probably about I don't know, like seven percent, uh, maybe maybe around that. Um, I think with with like housing association, it goes to maybe like 13, 14 percent. But I think kind of there is the is a kind of crucial kind of shift in in policy. It, it's um, like it, it, it's, it's kind of a fundamental key in the commercialization of housing along with kind of like widening access to, to credit. Um, and whilst these didn't have a specific racial angle at the time, though um, in the same way that other policies have, the impact was disproportionate in terms of what both what happened to estates and who had access to, who was able to, to, um, to buy that housing um, and you know, like to, uh, who was able to like, like benefit from from the policy. Um, so yeah, I think that and and you know it's like the UK has not recovered since in terms of its like social housing provision. Uh, so there's the kind of like a the key kind of like marker for me. Great. Um, and Stuart, I mean, Smith's picked quite a good one, but you know, feel free to. I'm sure there's many. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, I agree with, with both those points. I mean, just thinking about contribution that council housing made to, I suppose, addressing the various inequalities of housing that, that existed or emerged um, through the late during the late 19th and early 20th century. So when council housing became a mass tenure, not of last resort, um, not of a place where people get dumped, but a place where people could actually um, it was an as actually an aspirational tenure. I've heard people talking about council housing being something to aspire to, and actually, um, it helped people helped pull people out of very bad housing conditions. It created, I think, for some spaces of solidarity and community that were, were, were difficult in in the private rental sector, where the, where all the odds were stacked against the tenant. So it redressed and rebalanced power relations between landlord and tenant. Uh, it created new spaces of community, and so when as kind of like a deliberate state strategy to try to sell off as much of it as possible and and when that when that reaches its limit through the right to buy to then sell off estates um, and parcel up bits of estates off um, to housing associations then commercialize housing associations and make them much more about being private developers and private landlords again and not about social housing which is where which is where the housing association sector is being pushed uh, and then austerity kicks in um, and the whole protection of social rents, uh, we get the kind of uh, the start of, of market rents or market linking of rents. It all creates like multiple um, pressures um, that, that, that weren't there. So um, we've got pre-existing structural inequalities of obviously of race and access to housing and housing experience, but that was being ameliorated through public housing. And when you take that away, and you aggressively strip, asset strip it, and you replace it with the private rental sector, and you take our rights back to, you know, think things like they were in the in the early 20th century. I think that has the just one of the biggest, it's one of the biggest drivers of of widening inequality, which obviously 
is on top of all the other aspects of discrimination and inequality we, that, that layer into that. But it's fundamental, I think. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Stuart, and everyone for that. Um, I will just say, I feel like we're going to we're going to focus on some quite depressing aspects and housing conversations are often quite uh, depressing to engage with. But I do want to spend some time in a bit talking about uh, resistance as well. So hopefully we will get on to some uh, slightly more uh, exciting topics or happier topics. Um, but now back to the depressing stuff. Um, while housing is seen as an asset and not a human right, you know, the financialization of housing, as we've kind of talked about, which happened with uh, Right to Buy and the kind of deregulation of the banks. Um, thank you, Thatcher. Um, is it possible, do you think, uh, to see a solution to the current housing crisis in the UK? Um, I don't know if anyone wants to, to jump in that. So kind of why, while, while we see housing as an asset and rather a human right, do we think we're going to see a solution to the housing crisis? Do you want me to jump in? Go for it. Um, in, a, in a roundabout way, maybe, in the sense that um, the, the more we push the financialization of housing and, and more about make it more about asset bubbles and um, you know extracting value from 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 land um, and you know, a whole new class of rentiers emerging, global uh, investors and corporate landlords um, not producing wealth but just extracting from it. Um, we're going to hasten the contradictions that that we see, and I feel like that will generate. Um, and this may be I may be sounding a bit classically Marxist here, but that will generate kind of like um, the movement that that can take that on because people can't. When you have welfare, the welfare state being you know constantly cut, the NHS being cut in terms of services and access. When you have the impact of COVID, um, where, the, where basically all the walls are coming in on everyone. And then you and then you hit people with the fact that we're not going to regulate housing we're going to let it go to the highest bidder um, you rapidly hasten the the, the conditions the, the economic uh, and the political and the ideological conditions which people just say enough is enough and so it's interesting that enough is enough has emerged as a movement recently um in some respects i don't know what it why it took so long but, but on the other hand it suggests that the to the conservatives that there's more to cut um, and so they'll keep cutting until I think that they, they feel like they can get away with it. So I, th I think, no, in terms of there's no solution in terms of like, let's just come up with magic policy and that'll sort it all out. This is, this is like class war. Um, the people that run the country are landlords and support the landlord class and they support the global investor class and they're, they're propping them up. Um, they're, they're, many of them are speculators and, and operate in currency markets and so on, as, as we know through the whole discussion on Brexit. Uh, but like I said, it will it will hasten contradictions, and it will generate social forces that, that will seek uh, yeah, a more just housing system for certain, because that's the lesson of history, I think, that, 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 that lesson keeps coming back. Great. Um, I think I would add to that, that, that suggests that the, um, exposing those contradictions needs to be inclusive, that um, we can't kind of ration those contradictions of those who might vote for a particular political group or um, you know let's ameliorate the impact in London but let's leave the rest of the country to fall aside um, let's focus on these groups who are our, our traditional supporters um, so I think any resistance and any argument about those contradictions needs to reflect a very inclusive view of who is being impacted by um, the housing crisis as it is and i suppose i you know the tools are there i mean after the first world war before the second world war we had rent freezes the rent freeze after the, before the second world war lasted for 20 years um there was a kind of rebound from that but it feels like there's a mechanism in there for rent regulation which has run for nearly half a century in the uk that is eminently suitable uh, yeah, I love when we get onto the subject of rent regulation. It's something that's incredibly infuriating as a journalist, especially when I focus on housing stuff, because, uh, you know, I, I go into Westminster and I, I speak to politicians and spads and lords and, uh, and I, I say, you know, what's the solution? What's the solution? And they say, oh, no, no one's really researching rent caps or no one's really bringing us a kind of good info on it. And it seems like such 
um, a space that could be explored, but I will get onto some sort of mechanisms and solutions in a bit. Um, I don't know if, uh, Samir, you had anything you wanted to add. Um, so I, the I, I, I think the thing that I'd, I'd add, like one of the, the challenges I feel of, of where, you know, the, like financialization, the kind of like the, 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 the treatment of housing as an, as an asset is a real challenge to, to radical alternatives is that it basically makes radical alternatives um, even in the kind of like experimental kind of like stages, just really challenging and difficult. Um, and in you know, like in 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 my opinion, like you know, like uh, the, the kind of like transformative radical policy comes from like radical social like experiments and kind of um, things that happen in in civil society. So, for example, like e even throughout the the eighties, the um, you know like the like terrible like housing policy landscape you see the events of um of like 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 some, like uh, several radical housing organizations um that kind of like for example like focused on empty housing or focused on um um like cooperative housing and there there was the kind of the space for that because asset values were not as high land values were not as high um the challenge now like if you've got someone trying to get like a community land trust or a co-op or or a squat or anything like off the ground is that the 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 land values and the property values are so high that it really impinges on the ability to um to try and create radical alternatives um whether you're a whether you're a civil society group or even like you know like um council housing was pioneered by by amongst others like london county council um who decided to start building building housing um but i don't that like like local government i don't think it has the the appetite for again for like really like uh radical policy at that level i don't think it has the the, the power in that in that way in part because the the costs are just so astronomically high and that's my one of my concerns yeah definitely um smears touched on a subject close to my heart which is co-ops um uh i'm currently trying to resist an eviction by uh turning my uh tenancy into a, a co-op and it is incredibly difficult because uh when you have to let's say fundraise um, 10 percent of the value of the property um, in the 80s that might have been uh, 10k now that's something like 100 120 thousand pounds and that's you know not even including like what rents will be to then cover the costs of paying off a mortgage so you know it, it puts people in uh, even incredibly privileged positions with a lot of social agency um, it, it, in a situation where even like radical alternatives to housing seem uh, very difficult to access if not impossible um so i thought we could maybe move on to the subject of gentrification um which is something that we've touched on or regeneration is a subject i like to call it gentrification um i wondered if we could chat about how uh you might think gentrification has further exacerbated racial inequality in the uk and any particular um specifics and uh areas you thought of uh for example i've reported on um Pop Brixton, which is a development in Brixton, um, and uh, Peckham Levels, which is a development by the same organization, um, which is uh, secretly owned by a property developer, a multi million pound multi property developer, um, but that's sort of hidden uh, in, in its uh, company documents. Um, and those are both kind of examples of where um, really who the area. Um, was designed for changed as a result of this kind of mass investment. And it also came as a result of councils, obviously, uh, having very limited amount of money to develop empty car parks or, you know, empty spaces. And so they had to rely on external investment. And with that came certain requirements and issues. Um, so that is just a very small side note. But um, Stuart, maybe you want to jump in because you you spoke a bit about it in your um, presentation. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, uh, uh, kind of like the, let's say the urban scale, think about the 
the the huge loss of council housing through um, major regeneration schemes that always target social housing estates and, and particularly you know in the high value areas of of, of inner and central London. Um, think about who those people are that have been displaced from that from those homes. Yes, usually there's some kind of offer of rehousing in back into more social housing somewhere else, but from my experience, um, looking at the Mansfield North estate, um, there's so many ways in which that doesn't happen. So um, in some schemes, uh, because they have been designed by, usually by white people who, who own property, who don't experience maybe, um, or have never experienced say, um, discrimination in getting mortgages, um, or like by, by landlords or even by just like housing office and so on. They design schemes that they think will allow black homeowners to stay on a state or to stay on the regenerated state. Um, but actually what they've done is they've created an unbelievably traumatizing experience in its own right, because when um, people go to the bank to try and move their mortgages from their existing properties to the new property that they're being offered on the state, um, they, they, they get told that um, their credit scores are no good um, and, and the banks won't be issuing a mortgage. And they say, well, I've already got a mortgage. So yeah, but for the purposes of this process, because of the financial crisis, everything like this now gets regarded as, as like taking out a new mortgage and you just simply don't qualify for one. So that kind of issue of like access to credit, when someone feels like they've broken into like home ownership, the regeneration process will force those people back into private renting but because they they get like a capital value for their home they can't stay locally because they can't afford to buy um, so they have to rent but they also don't qualify for, for, for housing benefit because they've got a lump sum from from the regeneration scheme you know it's like their home loss their, their compulsory purchase um, uh, compensation um, and in the process the developers are then selling homes that they would have moved into for like two three times the money and and, and, and making more profit. Um, so I can see how at, at the kind of very small scale of estate regeneration, what looks on paper like, oh, regeneration doesn't displace people and it's trying to keep people together and communities together, it, it actually doesn't. It, it can displace, in, in the case I was looking at, one in three homeowners were displaced and about half into the private rental sector again. Um, and therefore, their mortgages that were £400 a month because they were right to buy mortgages, which were pretty cheap during the 80s and 90s, became 2,000, 2,500 monthly rent um, demands from landlords that were going to give them six months and then move them on and put the, put, the, put the rents up again. So very stable communities become permanently displaced, permanently being displaced around more and more difficult um, private rental areas of London. Thanks. Um, Samir? Um, yeah, just a, a, a couple of, of, of reflections. I, I think kind of one of the the key like policy responses that's been missing um, <laughs> is the like because so one one of the things that drives gentrification and, and and rises in in house prices is like in, like improvements it's like literally any improvement to 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 amenity as well. Like you you've got like commercialization is very much the kind of like the the, the, the big overarching thing but for example like uh like public transport improvements like um so the opening of the the or the reopening of the the london overground line through um through east london particularly um through hackney as part of the olympics had a, would have had a significant impact on on house prices and on gentrification and so you have a, a, an issue whereby like basically in public investment in transport, uh, schools, parks, like like think the things that make kind of like uh, like um, kind of like better and should actually be um, tackling inequality by providing good quality public services. Public services that um, are like can be can drive gentrification in terms of um, of raising the values value of housing um without a tax to bring that down um because it's not it's not an earned value to the to the housing like it's, there's no improvement that has been made to it it's just been it, it's price has risen because like public policy has 
um, has happened to um, it. Yeah, has happened to have brought in area. So um, I think that's a that's a significant issue, and it's one that's kind of slightly aside from the um, the 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 whole challenges with um, with yeah with with commercialization. It's that there's no mechanism actually to like redistribute when there's public investment that um, that benefits right homeowners. Um, I'm actually uh, going to jump to just keeping an eye on the time. My final question, then we'll start with you, Nigel, if that's OK. Um, so I thought let's look at resistance and let's look at solutions and let's look at positive angles to this story. Um, what are some of the most effective forms and examples of resistance that you've come across in your work or in your journalism and your time? And what mechanisms do we think can be put in place to see an improvement to the housing crisis? Okay. Uh, I, think, I think the first observation would be that it's not a single housing crisis, that what is happening happens in our communities and around us. So um, looking at Greater Manchester Tenants Union, there was a proposal to build a large student block in Hume, which has been resisted. Um, there's been an ongoing fight with the uh, ex leader of the Labour Council who has continually approved and given away public land um, and approved planning for developments which don't use don't return anything back in terms of what they're expected to so though it's minimal there is an expectation of a return of a proportion of public housing or affordable housing within planning permissions and that has been overridden in large parts of the development in Manchester. So I think at the level of a greater awareness, there's been quite a lot of action that has informed people. And in terms of direct resistance, I would point to that kind of direct action on resisting a particular development. Also various internal battles in terms of who has power within um, the council have, have begun hopefully to shift things but i do think it's a very local struggle we could go down the road to the next local party and the struggle there would be different um so I, I think it is about very local grassroots organizing and then federating the messages of what works across those different campaigns which from the outside looks like it's happening across the campaigns in london uh resisting the state regeneration but um you know I suppose that would be my starting point. Great. Uh, Samir? Um, so one of the, one of my kind of like favorite stories about how housing, po housing policy changed is, um, uh, is kind of in, in Scotland. So like Scotland has, you know, like it's much further in terms of like progressive housing policy, especially around renters' rights. Um, and the, one of the key organizations behind that are kind of like the Scottish, Tenants Union, I think, uh, if, I remember, if I remember the name rightly, or living, no, it's Living Rent. Um, so one of the the origin stories um, of it is a group of renters who had just a particularly unpleasant landlord. Um, like it's it's, it's, all, it's all the newspapers at the, um, at, at, at like at the at the time they like um, took him to court. They did all this stuff like. He was just so kind of like cartoonishly bad and evil, um, and and yeah, there's good like normative determinism because his name is Mark Fortune, um, <laughs> but um, they managed to kind of bring together this kind of like group of people and managed to because he was a large landlord within the city, like it was mostly kind of like like students and young people. Um, there's a lot of intimidation involved as, as well so bringing them together took took him on and from there formed a group and from there formed another formed a group in Glasgow and from there organized and started to influence um, policy and politics there was an open not an open semi semi kind of open door there because you know like power is more, is more devolved there is um, like and there's more like progressive conversation in in scotland um but that they kind of like at least kind of like for me it all kind of like came from this like one particularly unpleasant landlord who just like 
pushed his tenants too far um that they actually like were like oh yeah you know we're prepared to to like do this and to like de devote a significant portion of our lives to like taking this guy on and then taking to the next step and the next step and that is a real you know like not everyone is able to do that and you know like it's it's important to acknowledge there the kind of the inequalities particularly the racial inequalities in um movements of resistance is also like who who can who can take on the risks for example of of being arrested being fined losing their home through retaliatory actions um so there is something kind of there in terms of like how movements of resistance think about um like solidarity with people of color and with communities of color um great sorry i'm just keeping an eye on the time so we're meant to be going into the q a now but Stuart, if you want to come in with like a very short like 30 second minute long yeah thing, we oh, 30 on. seconds just to say i think where we're at now um tenants unions are have to be the way forward they are whether when where, where they emerge and they organize tenants um it's it's thinking a bit about how can we take the lessons of the trade union movement like where's the leverage in the housing movement where can we leverage uh, tenant power resident power and think about that not just having tenants groups representing people in committees but actually withholding rent um where where that's possible and that's just through building numbers it's building it's building scale um, and these things start local always. So this idea of the community organizing role is very, very important, I think. But we need a national coordination because we, we, we just don't have a national housing movement, it, whether it be in England or in the UK more broadly. And, um, we, have the, we have the elements for it. So we, need to, we do need to nationally coordinate as well. Great. Uh, thanks, Stuart. And thanks, everyone, um, for those answers. Um, we'll now move to the Q&A. So um, if you're watching and you haven't submitted a question, uh, please feel free to drop it in the Q&A box. Um, let's kick off. Um, so this is a question from Hannah. Um, what is the balance in the division of labour between the private sector, local authorities and central government agencies like Homes England or the Department for Leveling Up in securing more equitable, good quality housing? Great question. Who wants to jump on that? Um, from local experience, I would say that um, Homes England experimented with uh, lending to build to rent properties, that they have followed the line of the government in terms of home ownership being the uh, preferable characteristic but home ownership is quickly translated into landlord ownership um, so i think there is some resistance and some intention for resistance from local authorities because they do recognize the local need but they're relatively powerless in the face of uh, the national agencies and also private developers who are the necessary partners for any real development Yeah, so I I think, you know, like uh, the kind of the, the key like areas are different in, in each different kind of thing. So Department of Leveling Up, um, homes, communities, etc. Um, kind of uh, you know, like it's it's setting kind of regulation, uh, funding, and planning, um, like overarching planning policy. Homes England, it's like I feel it's mainly around the funding side. Of things because uh, you know so for example like the housing corporation uh through the 80s actually did like fund housing co-ops and things like like that so you could have a funding agency that is more that is that you know kind of more kind of experimental um local authorities again like like planning enforcement um and you know like those kind of like like place shaping or like regeneration kind of type projects it does, they, like they all have like the ability to do things and the the private sector i think the kind of the like one of the interesting discussions there is is how the uk is dominated by a few small um and a small number of of um of very large developers whereas um the place that's always kind of pointed to is somewhere is is um is uh, the Netherlands um, where they have like different kind of land assembly laws? And they have like much smaller developers, um, much more kind of self-build, which I, you know, like um, uh, is 
interesting but yeah the kind of like the at, at the moment the kind of the the have this very like oligarchical kind of uh like system of of very large developers that don't really have an interest i i think in in, in social housing yeah i would i would be wary of uh relying on the private sector for m much of a um I guess for providing much uh, equitable good quality housing as the question asks. Um, Stuart? I struggle a little bit with the question, not, not that it's not a great question, but I struggle with the answer really to it because it's almost like at the moment, um, I don't think the division of labor is designed to create equitable good quality homes. Mm -hmm. I think the system is designed, um, well, I think the system has been captured by the interests of uh, land owning developers who have acquired land and planning permissions so they can game it so they can release high high value high price housing when it maximizes their profits and share value um, at the expense of actually providing homes that the people need so um the only the, the the only real way of addressing that is we need to totally reform the building industry and the developer lobby, the real estate complex, that is not an easy thing to do, obviously, especially when it's in power. Uh, but I just don't see us kind of like tweaking the current system and expecting it to produce different outcomes. Uh, governments have to provide huge amounts of subsidy to build genuinely affordable homes. Um, unless we change the land, legal land system in the UK, and allow public bodies and uh, maybe social enterprise based developers who, who want to build social housing to compulsory purchase land at very low prices, agricultural prices, so they can build affordable housing and take, take the rentiers out of, out of um, land speculation. And that's like, that's like a radical agenda. It sounds pretty unhinged in, in the context of a conference, in the context we're in, but I don't see any other way. I mean, the market is not going to deliver affordable housing and it's so deregulated in terms of house building quality. All the focus is now on high rise building safety, um, huge amounts of resources and new frameworks and laws being thrown at anything above 18 meters. Everything else can just go up and burn. So, and I'm, be, and I, I'm being flippant to make a point that the standards of construction are terrible. So people are buying stuff that may not last mm -hmm. the term of their mortgage. Um, so we need to really, we need a real radical transformation of that. And that is not going to come from thinking about the balance of power between these existing bodies that are staffed by people who come probably from a very traditional understanding of like housing markets and what you do. And it's all about private developers. Um, and so that's part of a bigger transformational project, which, you know, I like to say a lot the word transformational and radical, but um, you know I don't know where they necessarily spring from. But they, but certainly the the, the situation we're in is like the conditions that can generate those ideas. Um, but we need a change of government, and 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 a new Labour government, if it did come in, has got to jettison a lot of the stuff that they seem to be coming back to. The the, the minimum starting point should be the Corbyn McDonnell housing and land approach, which was already being criticized for being too reformist. So it's yeah, controversial there. It, it seems like that. Thank you for that question, Hannah. I guess like the structure of the question in pointing to the division of labor between these areas kind of uh, shows in some respect, uh, the kind of failure of how we're managing uh, the housing situation in this country and that sort of none of those organizations seem able to do um, a, a, a really good job at doing at solving this issue and, and dividing the issue between them certainly isn't helping either. And it takes really imaginative and radical policies um, that people are too scared to touch because a lot of people have literal financial invested interest in things staying the same that, as they are. Um, so thank you, thank you for that question. Um, now moving on to a question from Anna. Um, thinking about the relationship between housing and racial inequalities you described, what are your thoughts on the likely observed racial inequities in climate transition initiatives in relation to housing in the UK? Um, does anyone want to jump in there? 
I'll go there first with just a kind of a feeling of nervousness about subsidising landlords to improve their properties um, with no controls over their ability to increase the rent once they've done so um, as a minimum, but also the idea of subsidising landlords who are making plenty of profit already. Um, so I think there's a, there's a kind of question mark about how that's dealt with across different tenures. So we kind of had a decent home standard investment for social housing um, throughout New Labour's period. Um, we've seen that kind of subsidy given to homeowners before because they couldn't afford to maintain their homes. But I do think this kind of rethinking that relationship between subsidies of landlords. So in previous years when landlords have had um, subsidies to build housing and let it out they their rent um, the rent they can collect has been restricted based on the money they've had subsidized without that kind of mechanism i could see this being a free-for-all and and taking on alongside that Stuart's a point about the quality of construction work that goes on would raise a further kind of nervousness about that kind of retrofitting So I think for um, um, for me, like uh, so, I did a little bit of work a while back on on um, coal homes and and racial inequality. Does it really, if like at the at the time, there's some interesting data around so because of like overrepresentation of of people of color within social housing. Social housing tends to be a, a better standard in terms of of being compared to private rented housing. So, but with, but one of the issues, like I, I think, if I remember, was like like owner occupiers, um, like um, people who are owner occupiers tended not to have the the, the money to invest in in insulation, renewables, etc. Um, I think there's you know like like the fundamental question, yeah, who who pays and how are you securing rights, um, and and um, one like mechanism I've I've heard of before is where kind of uh, like improvements that are done and there's basically kind of like a like a lean on the on the homes when it's sold that money is then um like goes back to like taken off the the sale price whatever I'm, I'm kind of like wary of that just because like that relies upon um house prices either going up or staying the same or, or whatever and like ideally they need to they need to fall um but yeah, I think this is this type of goes to like the key problem of, of especially in private renting. Mm -hmm. Can you can you do anything without like abolishing no fault eviction? Um, you know, because uh, it's, it's a similar thing with kind of like, for example, like um, adaptations for people with a disability. If you're in a private, if you're in a private rented home, you could literally be like like out next week, and the state has spent money on improving that home. And making it accessible, but without a uh, a right to 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 live there, like it's it's going to fall flat. Yeah, Stuart. Great, it's a really great question. Um, I, I don't want to be the the harbinger of doom again, but the, which is kind of what I specialize in. But the the there's some really bad experiences out there of retrofitting. Um, you can look up what's happened in Stoke. Um, you can look at what's happened in Wales on certain certain part of like, you know, um, attempts to kind of insulate homes um, that were not built to have insulation, um, putting new solar panels, getting contracts to put solar panels on every council house in, in, in Stoke and, and just unbelievably terrible um, work that got done. So there was no solar panels connected in many cases and people's roofs were leaking as a result of it. And the company then goes bust and can't be held to account um, and it's all taxpayers money down the drain so for me the solution to this potentially all these problems that's based on standards and safety and health and safety but also thinking about yeah if this is not done on a by, by the state reg, in a regulated way then all the inequalities that we know about that exist will be massively exacerbated through this kind of process so i i think it's partly about thinking what do we want to achieve through also through climate transition type so policies in terms of solving or ameliorating the housing crisis. If we think that the private landlord sector is part of the problem, then we should be using 
access to um, green subsidies done in a proper way, regulated way, to bring stock into the more of the public sector, into a regulated sector. So in exchange for subsidy, you have to set affordable rents and give people secure tenancies. Those kinds of deals should be done. Um, otherwise, you, you don't qualify. And if you don't meet the standards, you can't let the housing and you have to stop owning property. We need some really hard, hard policies that have a carrot and a stick. Um, mm. Otherwise, if we if it's everyone based on everyone's got to release equity from their properties, we're going to see the acceleration of gentrification and displacement in many cases. Certain, certain. Um, okay, I'm just just keeping an eye on time. Uh, we're, we're kind of at the end here, um, so I think that will be all the the questions that we take now. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, thank you for the questions you submitted. Thank you for sticking out this long. Um, thank you, Nigel Stewart and Samir, um, for chatting. Everything you've said has been so fascinating. I feel like I've learned so much. And even though I was on this talk and I'm chairing, I will probably go back and re-listen to everything you guys have said because it was it was really interesting and like a little uh, extra masters in uh, housing policy, which I really appreciated. Um, and so, thanks so much for everyone for joining and. Uh, yeah, hopefully lots to think about and uh, continue to resist and uh, fight for, you know, good equal housing. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye.